Welcome everyone to Grand Rounds. My name is Cortel, uh, Miguel Cortel LeBlanc. I'm one of the fourth year emergency medicine residents. And today we'll be talking about uh, some imaging controversies in emergency department trauma. And before getting started, there's actually a lot of people that I have to thank. Uh, my supervisors, Dr. Kwok and Dr. Yu. Uh, and I met with a lot of people that were very kind in lending their expertise as well. So Dr. Christian Bayancourt from here. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, who's joining us as well, and Dr. Wei and Dr. Fan from the Spine Group, uh, Dr. Nguyen from Neuroradiology, Dr. Ball, who's a trauma team leader in Foothills, uh, Dr. Lampron from our uh, trauma team here, and Dr. Sam Viancourt from St. Michael's Hospital, who's a trauma team leader there. And uh, uh, there's different members that lent me a lot of the local data to do some analysis. Uh, Dr. Chakra Bordi from Radiology here. Mr. LeBren and Ms. Knight from the Trauma Quality Improvement Team, and uh, Mrs. Davis helped me uh, form a comprehensive search strategy in the preparation of this talk. It's going to be divided into two parts. In the first part, we'll talk about some imaging controversies in cervical spine trauma. We'll talk about uh, the role of X-ray versus CT. Uh, what is the evidence of using flexion extension radiographs after a normal CT of the cervical spine? And what is the role of MRI after a normal CT in a patient who has either ongoing neck tenderness or some neurological deficits like paresthesias? And then we're going to shift gears entirely, and we'll talk about immediate whole body CT or the PAN scan in trauma. And we'll go over briefly the history of this imaging modality, the over, an overview of the earlier literature and some of its limitations, and the latest evidence on the role of uh, PAN scan in trauma. So to start, we'll begin with imaging of the cervical spine trauma. We won't be talking about spine immobilization. For that, I would refer you to Dr. Ritzi's Grand Rounds uh, that are available on the EM uh, Ottawa YouTube channel, uh, and they are a very comprehensive review on this topic. We're also not going to be talking about the patients that you can and should clear clinically with the Canadian C-spine rules. So we're going to be talking about the high-energy mechanisms, patients that are, have ongoing neck tenderness, they're un unable to move their neck. So let's start with the case. You're seeing a 30-year-old emergency medicine resident. He was competing against some staff in a 10K race, failed to reach the finish line, collapsed, face planted. You see him in the emergency department because he's complaining of ongoing neck tenderness, and he's unable to move his neck uh, 45 degrees. By a show of hands, how many people here would opt to x-ray this patient? Maybe close to half. How many people would CT him? Okay, there's a fewer number. If this patient was 70 years of age or 60, 60 years old, how many people would x-ray him? Okay, so the majority would CT in that instance. Um, there are actually some guidelines or some recommendations in these scenarios. The Congress of Neurological Surgeons is the body that the spine surgeons adhere to a little bit more. And they have this statement on this topic. They state that if a high-quality CT is available, then routine three-view radiographs are not recommended. And this statement is not, it does not have a qualifier regarding the age of the patient or the risk of them having an injury. And when we look at the EAST guidelines, which is probably what we adhere to a little bit more, um, they also firmly state that CT has supplanted plain radiography as the primary modality for screening suspected, suspected cervical spine injury. Now, to me, this was quite surprising, actually. Um, so we're going to look at the evidence in that, that fueled these guidelines. Most of the studies that it refers are uh, summarized in this meta-analysis from 2005. And overall, their aim was to compare the test performance of X-ray with CT in detecting cervical spine injuries. They included seven studies that totaled over 3,000 patients, and the majority of these studies were retrospective. There was not a single randomized controlled trial. And also, the reference standard varied widely between the studies, uh, but the majority utilized the radiologist's interpretation of CT as their gold standard test. What they found was that the pool sensitivity for X-ray in detecting cervical spine injuries was 52%. But there are some major issues that need to be accounted for in interpreting this result. If we look at the individual studies that made this meta-analysis, and uh, they had quite, varied, uh, quite a degree of variation in their inclusion criteria. 
And in red, you will see that many of them uh, included just patients that are much sicker than what we routinely see in the emergency department. Uh, four of the studies included patients that required uh, ICU care, that were obtunded, or that had um, altered mental status. And when we look at the cervical spine injury rate in these studies, it was also dramatically high. Most of the studies had rates higher than 10%. One study had a cervical spine injury rate of 76%, and that this is just not representative of what we see. So although this is the only meta-analysis on the topic, it's limited by the high heterogeneity of the studies, the fact that the populations are just not representative of, of what we see. Um, there was no uniform gold standard. The, there's no analysis on the adequacy of the x-ray, so we don't know whether a lot of um, the missed injuries are just because they were not able to obtain adequate views. Uh, and it also lacked uh, a uniform um, definition of what constitutes a clinically important injury. What we can conclude from it is that in the severely injured patient or the patient who's at high risk of a cerv cervical spine injury, x-ray is likely insufficiently ins uh, sensitive. But the quality of the evidence is poor, and this is not applicable to our ambulatory and alert patients that we see most commonly. Still, these studies were sufficient to, um, to, for the changes that were made for the EASE guidelines. And just to highlight how different of a population this is, our cervical spine injury rate for patients that we screen with a Canadian C-spine rule is anywhere between 1 and 2.5%. Now, since the publication of the meta-analysis, there is one uh, prospective study that is worth discussing. This is not referenced in the EASE guidelines but um, they included patients with injury rates that approach uh, our own. So they prospect prospectively uh, included uh, 1,500 patients consecutively that were um, suspected for cervical spine injury, and all patients had an X-ray and a CT. And what they found was that there were, there were 78 patients with injury, 50 who had clinically significant injuries. Their definition for a clinically significant injury was one that required either operative treatment, halo, or a rigid collar. And the typical patient in the study was a 37-year-old man who was involved uh, most commonly in an MVC. What they found was that the sensitivity for extras in this study was 36% in detecting uh, as clinically significant injuries. They also attempted to stratify patients who had injuries into low, moderate, and high risk. Um, and what they found was that close to a third of the injuries were in patients who were deemed to be at low risk. One of the things that is really important to recognize is um, their definition of clinically importance. So most recent studies in the cervical spine trauma literature have gone away from including rigid collar as an endpoint for a clinically important injury. The reason for this is that there is high, vari uh, high um, variation in when uh, spine surgeons or emergency physicians actually prescribe a rigid collar. The majority of the time is uh, prescribed for uh, comfort and often for, to just wear during daytime hours. And most of the patients that uh, wear rigid collar do not have an unstable injury. So if we recalculate their, um, their two by two table using what we used as a clinically important definition from the Canadian C-spine rule study in 2001. Their sensitivity is just marginally better, around 42%. Still, the majority of these x-rays were just inadequate x-rays. They did not obtain proper three views. When we look at the rate of um, the sensitivity of x-rays that were well done or adequate, the sensitivity was around 86%. So, this prospective study had high compliance, um, and the majority of their patients had both X-rays and CTs. And one of the major strengths is that their C-spine injury rate approaches that of our own or, or the literature. In this case, it was around 3%. Uh, but it's limited by the fact that they, there's no analysis on, um, on the inadequate X-rays subgroup. Uh, there's a small sample number of index cases the tool that they use to assess the overall risk of having an injury is not one that is externally validated, so we cannot draw conclusions from that. And they also stratify the patients for risk of injury after they already had the imaging results. Um, and we, we always need to be wary of applying results that are performed in the nexus population to our Canadian C-spine rule population. <clears throat> 
So overall, we can conclude from it is that in this population, x-ray was insensitive for C-spine injuries, but the generalizability is limited by the lack of analysis of adequate x-rays and the slightly different population. Going back to the ease guidelines, which is, a, again, like a firm recommendation that CT has replaced x-ray as a primary modality. Um, I think that this is definitely based on signals that CT outperforms X-ray, as we would expect. But there's limited evidence to suggest that the same conclusion applies to the patient who's at low risk of having a cervical spine injury. And I think it's really important to also think about what would be the effects and the implications if, of, if we just replace all X-rays with CTs. What would be the impact on the length of stay for our patients? Not only do they have to wait for a CT, but you also have to wait for a CT read. At the moment, it's not common practice for most emergency physicians to interpret their own cervical spine CTs. And perhaps in an era where CT fully replaces X-ray, that might be a conversation that we actually might have to have, whether, whether we're going to have to learn to interpret these, much like we had to do when the utilization of CT heads began to increase. There's also the issue of increased radiation. So a C-spine CT has anywhere between 10 to 60 times the radiation exposure than an X-ray. And the thyroid is the more susceptible uh, uh, organ in that region. Uh, many of the patients that we evaluate for cervical spine injuries are younger patients. And we don't know what are the implications or the effects of repeated higher dose uh, CT in, in these patients. And there are also larger departmental consequences. So what would be the, would, are we going to expect higher volumes from our neighboring centers, sending all the, all the patients that they're suspected of a cervical spine injury so that we can clear them here with a CT? Last year, there were 991 cervical spine x-rays that we did in the emergency department. And this number is actually diminishing. It's 20% lower than two years ago. On this graph, the fluctuating line represents the cervical spine x-ray ordering rate per 1,000 emergency department visits. Uh, and the straight horizontal dotted line in the middle represents the three-year mean. On the far left, uh, um, corresponding to 2015, you will appreciate a significantly higher ordering rate compared to the mean. And at the far right, uh, corresponding to 2017, we've been ordering far fewer than the mean. And if we compare this to the spine CT ordering rate, which is depicted here at the bottom, at the far right, you can appreciate that uh, there is a higher spine CT ordering rate that corresponds to a time period where we've been, we've been beginning to order fewer x-rays. In speaking with our spine surgeons here, they had lots of insight regarding the guidelines, uh, their interpretation, and also their applicability or lack of their applicability. Dr. Mohammed emphasized that the current ease guidelines are just not that practical. They don't represent the true spectrum of the patients that are being evaluated for su suspected cervical spine injuries. He also feels that there are feasibility issues in CTing everyone, and that it is likely not an economic economically effective practice. Dr. Fan echoed many of those same sentiments. He was also cautionary with regards relying on x-ray in the patient with high velocity mechanisms and neck pain who he feels a CT is required. However, he also sees a role for x-ray in the case of a younger cooperative patient with a normal neurological exam. Dr. She Dr. Wei excuse me, shared some of those same thoughts. Um, but in his view, however, this is also medical legal matter. Uh, he wonders whether if there is a negative outcome, then could a lawyer question why the guidelines are not being followed? And his recommendation is that if we are discharging a patient after relying solely on x-ray, then it is crucial to ensure that patients know that if their neck pain is not getting better, that they should represent for an assessment. And I think that this is a sentiment that we would all share as well. So going back to the case, so the guidelines that recommend CT unconditionally to clear the C-spine, they stem from populations for high, uh, with high C-spine injury prevalence. And in the severely injured or polytrauma patient, x-ray is insufficiently sensitive. But evidence is lacking 
to determine the X-ray sensitivity in the young low-risk patient. We'll move in uh, to the second case. You're seeing a 60-year-old uh, man who's involved in an MVC. Uh, he has neck tenderness and paresthesias. His cervical spine CT is negative. Uh, you deem that the best modality to further evaluate his C-spine is an MRI. However, ra radiology recommends flexion ex extension radiographs prior to doing so. What is the role of flexion extension radiographs in this patient, in someone who has a normal CT? This is a, a situation that I've encountered a few times, and in speaking with some of the residents and some of the staff as well, it's also a repeating theme where um, prior to an MRI, we're asked uh, what the results are of the FlexX are or to order FlexX. So a flexion extension radiographs um, involve uh, the patient flexing and extending the, the neck at least 30 degrees and they need to visualize the entirety of the, spine, of the C-spine all the way to T1. And the flexion and extension is often limited in the acute setting when they're still complaining of ongoing neck tenderness and uh, pain. The role of these radiographs is to assess for instability of the C-spine and uh, in, in cases of major hyperextension or hyperflexion forces. They were most commonly performed in the pre-CT era. So the question remains, with the advent of thin-slice CTs that have high resolution, is there still a role for FlexX after a normal cervical spine CT? There was a systematic review that was published in 2013 uh, from a group in the Netherlands who looked at six different studies that totaled uh, over 1,000 patients with the aim of assessing the sensitivity of FlexX views in detecting C-spine injuries. Still, there was high heterogeneity between the studies. Uh, three of them focused on the obtunded patient and patients in the ICU. And there was, also, there was also high variability in the gold standard that was used. Some of them relied on CT, others MRI, others on whether the patient was going for surgical intervention. The authors also looked at the adequacy of the FlexX radiograph. So how often were they getting good views? Uh, this is summarized here. So each bar corresponds to a different study. The blue bars uh, show the number of adequate FlexX radiographs, and the orange bars the number of inadequate FlexX views. And the percentage at the top just summarizes the percentage of the times that they were getting appropriate views. All of the studies had adequacies less than 70%, except one. The ligamentous injury rate in this systematic review was 1.1%. And the sensitivity and specificity both ranged anywhere between 0 to 100%. Overall, zero clinically significant injuries were identified out of all, the stud all, all of these studies after, uh, by FlexX after a normal uh, CT of the C-spine. So this study used an exhaustive search strategy, and it attempted to exclude studies of lower uh, quality, but still there was a high degree of clinical heterogeneity with multiple different definitions, and even just the way that the FlexX maneuvers were performed deferred from study to study. Um, there were also very few index cases. Their lig ligamentous injury rate was 1.1%. Uh, however, it consolidates much of the information that we have about uh, the role of FlexX after normal CT. There has been one retrospective study, one large and published since then, that is worth discussing. Uh, it was by a group in Australia that retrospectively uh, looked over a seven-year period patients who had a normal CT um, and then had FlexX views, and then they compared it to the reference standard of either MRI or requiring a surgical intervention. Over 13,000 patients were evaluated, and out of those, uh, 2,400 patients had a normal cervical spine CT. Out of these patients, 176 of them had FlexX radiographs. And when we look at these patients, the 176 who had FlexX radiographs after a normal CT, an abnormality was seen in four of these patients. However, on MRI, those four were false positives. And there were four different patients that had abnormalities on MRI, although those were clinically insignificant injuries. So overall, there were four false positives, zero true, zero true positives, and four false negatives in this study. And when they looked at the adequacy rate of flex X views, they found that out of the 176 uh, X-rays, 168 of them were inadequate. 
Overall, the sensitivity was 0% for flex X radiographs after a normal CT C spine. Here, the study used an appropriate reference standard and they had a large sample size, but it's limited in that it's a single center uh, retrospective study that relied on data, on database data that introduces confounders. There was also no follow up after hospital discharge, which introduces the risk of missed injuries. Uh, and the reasons for why the x rays were inadequate is, is missing altogether in the study. So, overall, um, the evidence suggests that after a modern thin slice CT that is completely normal of the C spine, there is no role in the emergency department for flex X radiographs. So, we'll move to the third case for the C spine portion of the talk. We'll talk about a 40-year-old intoxicated woman who falls on the stairs. She has superficial signs of head and neck injury. Um, uh, the CT of her head and neck are unremarkable, but she's complaining of ongoing midline neck tenderness and paresthesias that are resolving at the moment. How many people here feel that this patient requires an MRI? Okay, I see a few hands. How many people feel that this patient definitely does not need an MRI? So probably a lot, of un a lot of uncertainty as to what, what is the value of an MRI in a patient like this. So the three main reasons that MRI uh, gets ordered after a normal CT are if the patient is complaining of ongoing neck tenderness, whether there are no neurological deficits, or if the patient is uptunded or unavailable. And for the last scenario, we're only just briefly going to talk about that case. I'm not going to go into, there's a lot of literature in the uptunded patient, but I'm not going to go into it, as this is a scenario that's most commonly encountered by, um, by our trauma colleagues and our ICU team as well. So with regards to the awake and alert patient, um, there's very few systematic reviews and meta-analyses. There, there was one meta-analysis published last year that included all types of patients, both uptunded and awake. Uh, there were 23 studies overall. And in total, there were over 5,000 patients. When we just look at their, their all-comers, all patients with suspected cervical spine injuries who had a normal CT, an MRI uncovered an injury 15% of the time. But out of all patients, 0.3% of them had a, a clinically significant injury. And when we look at the awake patients, which was 1,300 uh, patients in the study, an MRI uncovered an injury 7% of the time. And 0.7% of all comers had a clinically significant injury. Okay. So what we can conclude from that study is that MRI detects a significant number of injuries after a negative CT, but a small minority of them are unstable. This was a comprehensive meta-analysis and one of the few that addresses the awake population um, I, 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 I caution regarding the interpretation of the pooled analysis that they, that, they, that they report in their study because there's such high heterogeneity between the studies. And the results are largely driven by retrospective studies as well. So I think it's important to look at the most relevant study that was included in this meta-analysis. That was a study by Shelby Resnick and Kenji Inaba in California. Uh, who attempted to look at the value of MRI after a normal CT of the C-spine in patients with either ongoing neck tenderness, excuse me, or a neurological deficit. Out of the uh, 6,400 patients that they um, assessed, 830 patients were enrolled in this study. They defined a clinically significant C-spine injury as one that required either surgical intervention or halo application or if after consulting with their neurosurgeon, if the use of a rigid collar was deemed absolutely necessary for the treatment of a non-stable injury. So they had 830 patients, and overall, close to 20% of them were found to have evidence of C-spine injury on either CT or MRI. And overall, 2.8% of all patients had a clinically significant injury. When we look at the patients that just had MRI after a negative CT, there were 15% of them who had an injury identified on MRI that was not on CT. 
but none of those injuries were clinically significant, nor any did the, uh, uh, changed management. It's important to highlight that only 100 MRIs were performed in this study. Overall, their sensitivity for clinically important injuries for CT was 100%. And this is in the population with, uh, with either ongoing neck tenderness or neurological deficits. So this is one of the few prospective studies who has a really well-defined population with a clear definition of, their, of, their, uh, uh, of clinically significant injuries, but it's limited by the low uh, rate of MRI ordering. And the majority of the MRIs that were ordered were actually because the CT was equivocal. There was also no follow-up after discharge, which introduces the risk of missed injuries. And unfortunately, uh, all neurological deficits were analyzed together. And the way they actually have it coded in their data uh, set is just as neurological deficit. So it's even now it's impossible to separate sensory versus motor. So some of the authors from this study collaborated uh, with other centers, and they built on their, on their um, results uh, in forming a multicenter trial that was published two years ago or a year and a half ago. Um, it was across 18 trauma centers in the West Coast, one of them which was Foothills in Calgary. And uh, they evaluated over 10,000 patients that were, had, uh, that were suspected for cervical spine injury. Over half of these patients, uh, over 5,000 patients were enrolled be uh, and had ongoing midline neck tenderness. So out of the 10,000 patients that they saw, there were 1,000 who had a positive CT and 195 of those patients had a clinical, clinically significant injury. When we look at the patients with a negative CT, so this is over 9,000 negative CTs, there were three missed injuries. Okay. So overall, their sensitivity for a clinically significant injury was 98.5%. And the three patients who had missed injuries, all three of them had motor deficits that were consistent with central cord syndrome that would have warranted an MRI anyways. So this is the largest multicenter prospective study of its kind in addressing this question. And one of the major strengths is, surprisingly, is one of the few that actually differentiates between sensory and motor deficits. Uh, because it had such a large sample size of patients with ongoing midline tenderness, it's applicable for that pop uh, population. Uh, however, they enrolled few patients that had ongoing neurological deficits. So there was only 576 and 182 who had uh, sensory phen phenomena like paresthesias. The MRI ordering rate in this study was also low. It was less than 10%. And uh, they were ordered due to the physician discretion. So I sat down with Dr. Nguyen from Neuroradiology, and we talked at length about the different roles for MRI their perspectives and experiences about the yield of MRI in different populations. Um, he feels that from their, their experience, uh, it, it, this study actually supports what, the, what they see, that for the patient with ongoing midline neck tenderness, the yield of MRI is really low. And he also goes on to say that in the patient with isolated paresthesias, who has no radicular pain and no motor deficits, the yield of MRI is also low, and its, value, and its value is questionable. He goes on to say that if, due to clinical judgment, an MRI is still felt to be warranted, then these can usually be done as an outpatient. And we're talking here about the awake and alert patient that we see, because, uh, of course, the patients that are seen by trauma, that's a different spectrum of patients. So, oh, sorry. Going back to our case, so M MRI does not add any clinically significant information after normal CT in the awake patient who has persistent neck tenderness and an absolutely normal CT. There is some emerging evidence to suggest that the value of MRI is questionable for isolated paresthesias after normal CT. If I were to just summarize the take-home points of the C-spine uh, of this C-spine portion. Uh, I would put it into an algorithm that, uh, that would, I would follow with my patients. So if the patient is alert, the priority is to clear them clinically if we can. If we can't, then I still consider whether they're young and low risk. Um, 
And this is with caution because I recognize that the guidelines are based on signals that suggest that CTs greatly outperform x-rays and that the sensitivity of x-ray is not perfect. But we talked about some of the limitations of that uh, literature. So the caveat here is that if I opt to do a, a cervical spine x-ray in these patients, I make sure that the discharge instructions are crystal clear, that they know that they, that they have to come back if they have uh, ongoing pain or tenderness. If not, then we're going to CT. And if the, C, if the CT is absolutely normal, then we look as to whether they have motor deficits, isolated prosthesias, or persistent neck tenderness. In the patient with motor deficits, it's a given. They need an MRI. With isolated paresthesias, there's, there's emerging evidence that the role is questionable. There's different options here uh, as to how you, you can approach with this patient. No one would fault you for doing an MRI in a patient with ongoing paresthesias after a normal CT. But another option is outpatient spine follow-up. In the pa patient who has persistent neck tenderness, MRI adds no value in the eMERGE. And another option for this patient would be outpatient spine follow-up. These two groups at the bottom right um, are, are patients that are ideal candidates for something that Dr. Mohammed is actually trying to start, which is a rapid access spine fellow clinic. And we can talk a little bit more about that after the presentation. So in terms of some future directions, uh, we need more prospective studies to assess the sensitivity of cervical spine x-rays in the young and low risk po populations. Uh, and a few, uh, a few more studies with larger sample sizes to assess whether in paresthesias MRI is really um, not needed. And lastly, one thing that I think would be really interesting is if we look at um, a different efforts or initiatives to see whether emergency physicians can interpret cervical spine CTs much like we do with CT heads. So we're, we're going to shift gears entirely now, and we're going to talk about uh, imaging in the high-energy trauma patient so the idea of, a, of an immediate PAN scan. And we're going to look briefly at the history, the earlier literature that led to its introduction, and uh, we'll look at the latest evidence in this topic. So let's start with the case. Let's talk about a 30-year-old guy who's involved in a high-speed snowmobile incident. He has signs of facial trauma, neck pain. He has bruising along his chest. He's tacky at 120, but his blood pressure is normal. His oxygenation is normal. The, remaining, the remainder of his trauma survey, including log roll, are normal, and his fast is negative. How many people feel that this patient requires an immediate whole body CT or an immediate PAN scan? Okay, there's probably about a, a fifth of very subtle hand raises. How, do, how many people feel that this patient uh, requires selective imaging, meaning that you tailor your imaging depending on your, on your physical findings. Okay. It's probably about half of the room. So one of the reasons that I think it's really important to discuss this is that injuries obviously are one of the most common presentations in the eMERGE. In 2010, there were over 1 million emergency department visits for injuries in Canada, costing the system almost $9 billion. And last year, we treated over 3,400 patients for injuries, 832 who were uh, seen by the trauma uh, team or were severely injured. Out of the patients who, um, out of the blunt trauma patients who were assessed by trauma, 41% of them had an immediate whole body or a whole body CT in the emergency department. One thing that surprised me when uh, I was looking at our, 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 local, our, our local data is that out of the patients that were assessed by trauma, the whole body CT uh, ordering rate uh, was completely opposite to what I expected per age. So the majority of the patients that were receiving whole body CTs were in the 15 to 30 and in the 45 to 60 age group. And patients older than 61 were actually re receiving the fewest number or the fewest proportion of them would get a whole body CT. Now, Rapid immediate whole body CT in trauma evaluation was not always feasible. CTs used to be bulky, slow, and much more expensive. They used to rely on a single detector that would cut thick slices and as a result had low resolution. But with the advent of multi-detector CTs, you're able to image thinner slices at, much, uh, at a much faster rate. Uh, 
And these two key advances is what led to the introduction of a whole body CT or PAN scan in trauma evaluation. There's different definitions about what constitutes a whole body CT protocol, but by far the most common is one that is a non-contrast study of the head and neck, along with uh, a CT chest, abdo, pelvis with contrast, and ideally with spine uh, reconstruction. The ability to perform these protocols quickly in the eMERGE is quite recent. It's barely as old as Tom Hanks' role in Castaway. <laughs> Yet, in spite of just how recent it is, it was uh, adopted pretty seamlessly. And it's largely because many early studies showed a great deal of benefit. So uh, length of stay in the emergency department, many studies show that it, it, it could decrease with uh, rapid pen scanning as much as 30 minutes. And more impressively, there are mortality benefits as large as 36%. And just as, uh, as there was so much um, enthusiasm for pan scanning and, and trauma, there were different groups that had opposing views about its harm. So there were warnings about the increased costs or radiation exposure and the uncertainty about what to do with incidental findings once we have them. Out of curiosity, are there any guesses about what is the best estimate about how many uh, whole body CTs are needed to cause one additional cancer-related death? So not just cancer, but a death from cancer. Like 2,000, 1,250. Is it, whoever, who said 250? Are you a radiologist? No? Oh, it's just, <laughs> uh, it's about 300. Now, uh, there are two main forces uh, that limit our ability to draw conclusions from, from a lot of the retrospective studies that are performed uh, in whole body CT and trauma. The first includes confounders other than whole body CT that lower the mortality for these patients. And the second is the concept of injury severity uh, score inflation, severity, severity inflation from patients that undergo a whole body CT. So we're going to go through these. So because the whole body CT literature, uh, a lot of it relies on retrospective and, uh, and observational studies, it, inclu it includes centers with high clinical heterogeneity. And ultimately, our goal is to determine what is the mortality benefit from performing a PAN scan. But many trauma centers that adopted rapid whole body CT protocols also saw, saw other advances in trauma care. So as an example, earlier transfusions and more aggressive, um, uh, more aggressive access to interventions and more rapid definitive surgical therapies, or e even just the expertise and comfort of a well-oiled trauma team handled severely injured patients. All of these factors are confounders that would also lower the mortality for severely injured patients. So, Although what we want to do is identify the degree, the benefit that PAN scanning confers, what uh, a lot of these studies show is that benefit plus all the, uh, the benefit from, the, from these other interventions as well. So to use uh, sepsis as an analogy, what we need to determine is whether whole body CT and trauma is more similar to earlier antibiotics or is it more similar to measuring the CVP? And it's hard to unbundle PAN scan from the rest of the trauma management. The second issue with a lot of the earlier PAN scan literature, uh, literature is that uh, um, is the, this concept of severity inflation or ISS inflation. So in trauma, uh, the severity of patients is often uh, summarized by score, most commonly the ISS, or the injury severity score. This is an anatomic score of injury. It looks about at how, the degree of injury that different body systems uh, endure. And there are many other injury severity scores. Some of them include physiologic parameters as, as well. But they're all pretty similar. And ultimately, one thing that they're used for is to predict mortality in patients. So let's go through an example to see how uh, how this can affect the conclusions from the literature. Let's take John, who's a 68-year-old guy uh, who's drunk. He fell down the stairs. He's on anticoagulants. There's signs of head injury and facial abrasions. 
and John could present to one of two centers. He could present to the center on your left where they have a selective imaging uh, practice or the center on the right where they immediately do a PAN scan on all their trauma patients. If he presents in the, on the center of your left, there's a subdural hemorrhage that gets identified along with the one on displayed rib, rib fracture. In the center on the right, however, in addition to the subdural hemorrhage, they also identify a couple of pulmonary contusions and a low-grade renal laceration. Now, in many patients, the findings from a PAN scan will change management, for John, but for John in this case, they don't. So John's mortality is already established depending on, regardless of which of these imaging approaches uh, he has, but the injury severity score that gets recorded for John is different depending on which hospital it is. So his predicted mortality in a center that has a PAN scanning pra practice would be higher. And therefore, when you look re retrospectively, you might notice a gap from his actual mortality and what you'd actually predict from his injury severity score. So due to ISS inflation, the benefit between actual and predicted mortality may not be from whole body CTs. This effect uh, diminishes with a lot of the later trauma literature, but it's certainly present in some of the, the earlier studies. So let's take a look at some of the latest evidence in uh, whole body CT. There are quite a few systematic reviews and meta-analyses, all include slightly different um, uh, studies, and the, a lot of them conflict each other, and they, they have uh, varying results. This is the latest one uh, from last year. It included one randomized controlled trial, five prospective cohort studies, and five retrospective studies. Overall, they found an odds ratio in favor of the PAN scanning strategy of 0.74. This is, a, this is a mortality benefit odds ratio. And from the three studies that were included that reported time in the ED, they found a decrease of 14 minutes. So this, this was the largest uh, recent uh, systematic review on this topic, and they attempted to include only higher quality studies. Uh, it was still influenced, the, the results, of the, the degree of the shift of the odds ratio was heavily influenced by the retrospective studies, however, and only one of them was a randomized control trial. And there was high degree of heterogeneity between the studies as well. So we'll take a look at the one randomized controlled trial that was uh, analyzed in that systematic review. And many, if not most of you, would be familiar with it. We covered it last year in Journal Club. That was the REACT-2 study. So in REACT-2, the authors prospect prospectively included trauma patients with either significant vital sign abnormalities, um, uh, major traumatic diagnoses, and these included things like failed chest or major abdominal injury, pelvic fractures, among others, and uh, also high energy mechanisms for trauma. It was conducted in five uh, European centers, four of them which were in the Netherlands and one in Switzerland, and overall they randomized 1,400 patients to either a whole, an immediate whole body CT strategy or a selective imaging strategy. 541 and 542 patients were analyzed in each arm, respectively. Their baseline characteristics were pretty similar. So the mean age was 42 and 45 years of age. By far, the most common mechanism was blunt trauma in the study, 98 and 99 percent. Few of them were in anticoagulants, so 3 percent and 13 percent. And the injury severity score was similar, 20 and 19. What they found is that uh, in their study, there was no difference in in-hospital mortality, 16% in both arms. And 30-day mortality was also the same, 17 and 16. They report a, a decrease in overall radiation in the select, selective imaging arm. Um, however, you can see that it's only a, a median decrease of 0 0.3 millisieverts, so like three x-rays. Uh, but this is the, the, the statistical significance here is driven by the range. So over 45% of their patients had a radiation dose lower than the lowest dose in the immediate whole body CT arm. They also looked at a few different subgroups, so patients with polytrauma and patients with traumatic brain injury, and they found no difference between immediate whole body CT and uh, selective imaging. So this was uh, a much needed uh, RCT in, in this topic is the first one to be done, and it used a large sample size. Uh, and it's also a multi multi-center study, but it has some major limitations. Uh, most importantly, almost half of the patients in the selective imaging arm 
ended up receiving the equivalent of a whole body CT from their segmental imaging. And this is a, a major criticism for the study. Uh, and in speaking with Dr. Lampron and some of the members of the trauma team, this is one of the reasons for why the study really loses a lot of applicability. Uh, it's also important to keep in mind that selective imaging does not mean not pan scanning. It just means that you're using your, uh, your history and your exam to guide what kind of imaging the patient requires. Their inclusion criteria was also uh, a little bit broad, and it resulted in over a third of the patients having an injury severity score less than 16. Um, and I caution uh, uh, about the interpretation of their benefit with a radiation dose, since it was uh, driven largely by a difference in the range rather than the median. So overall, the evidence is conflicting. There are multiple trials uh, that show benefit from whole body CT, uh, from immediate uh, whole body CT in trauma. Um, but the best quality of evidence of RCT shows no mortality benefit. We need to recognize that it has some, some limitations. So still, uh, just like we are right here, uh, we, we tend to opt for a selective imaging strategy, and I think that we need to consider the patient departmental factors in making that decision. And uh, selective imaging has the potential to significantly reduce radiation exposure, but we don't know to, uh, to what extent uh, uh, it does, actually. Some future directions that uh, the immediate whole body CT versus selective imaging literature needs to take is, uh, I think that a replication of the REACT2 study in North America would be really useful in a population um, that is more similar to ours and where trauma management is also a little bit different than in Europe. Uh, and I think it would be really important to also define age subgroups so we can see who benefits most from an immediate whole body CT. Um, and lastly, a cost utility analysis to see what is the economic uh, effect of uh, having a liberal immediate whole body CT strategy in trauma. So with that, I will close, and I'm happy to take any questions.